Thank you, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight about woodland ecosystems. And first, let me just tell you about this as an idea. You know, when we're promoting use of native plants, what we're really wanting to do is grow things that grew before there was a garden, whether they were gardeners here. Because it makes our job easier, because the plants can handle what our climate dishes out, and because it supports the local eco ecosystem. So this is an extension of that idea, not just using native plants and planting them in the environment that they want to be planted in, but also arranging them in a way that is already found in nature. So this is a basic idea um, of how are the plants arranged before there were gardeners. And so the idea that we're going to work with tonight is if you want more success and less work, you're going to copy Mother Nature because then she's there helping you out. And especially we all know here in August that we need all the help we can get. So what were the naturally occurring hill country landscapes? There's really four. And I, I, I ran this by Robert Edmondson at the Texas Forest Service. Like, Robert, did I miss anything? So he helped me refine these. So they were wildflower meadows, these big open fields. Um, then through the creeks, they were he more heavily wooded and the riparian areas, and this word just means the watershed into the creeks, the surrounding areas, were much more heavily wooded and forested. And then we had some woodland where there was really tall trees that made a thick canopy that shaded out the understory, so it was thinner at the bottom. And then the last one, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, was we had islands of dense woodland where there was vegetation on the ground and in the middle and kind of up here and way up high um, that were islands in the middle of meadows. And so you might hear these described as tree moths. Um, if you're under a wildlife management program, you know, they tell you to um, maybe mow your property in a crosshatch um, pattern in order to create these islands of vegetation to create edge. This is all the same idea that there's a naturally occurring landscape that looks like a really dense woodland clump. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, um, when you, so when you have this kind of an ecosystem on your property, you've created a habitat for animals. And it creates wildlife food sources. You can see here's my redbud tree. There's a juniper hair streak butterfly on it. Um, and it, you also create water capture and water retention. And a little later in the presentation, I'm going to make the case for that. That is not just the assertion that, oh, yeah, when you use native plants, it saves water. But give you an idea of why it saves water and how it saves water. That'll make sense to you. Um, and you've created a sustainable ecosystem. When we started doing this, we started doing it by accident. We had these hackberry trees and we put a beauty berry under there and we added a few things and some things sprouted on our own. And suddenly we, we started to have, you know, wildlife that we hadn't seen before. And it, we didn't know very much when we got started. We learned about it as we went, but you're creating a sustainable ecosystem. So this is one of the surprises that we found. And I thought this was a hummingbird nest. And Kathy Saucier was there when I said, oh, look, here's my hummingbird nest. It's made of grass and spider webs. You can see it and has these little tiny eggs in it, like the size of peanut m and And she said, oh, no, you have Bell's Vireo. So I didn't know Bell's Vireo. Thank you, Kathy. But you get, so you don't have to know anything about the wildlife. You don't have to know their scientific names. They just arrive. And it's a really nice and gratifying experience. So you create beauty when you, when you put together this kind of an environment. You create a habitat with edge. And I've used this word already. That edge is, it's like the difference between the fairway and the rough on a golf course or between the lawn and the beds. And edge is a thing that is both attractive and useful. Um, wildlife love edge because they can hide in the thicket area and then run out into the meadow area for food and then run, run back into hiding. And the argument has been made that people too like edge. The reason we plant trees around our house and we have lawns is there's something inherently safe to creatures that feel safe about edge. And that feeds our aesthetic, our sense of what feels inviting and beautiful. So. We're creatures too, and we tend to create edge around ourselves 
and because of how it feels. So we're creating habitat with edge here. There's also a cooling effect. When I go out, so we have a, we have one of these mops very close to our gate. Um, it's partly in the yard and partly out of the yard. And when we go, when I go through that gate in the morning, I go out to feed the horses or in the afternoon when it's, you know, a, a thousand hotter than the surface of the sun. And I'm walking back. As soon as I come to this clump, the temperatures drop. And I haven't measured it. And I can't tell you that scientifically so, but I'm a human being. I know whether I'm warmer or cooler. And as soon as I get there, the temperatures have dropped. And when I step into the yard, it's cooler because of this. So we might not be able to do anything about the 105 degrees going on out there, but you can make your, your ecosystem around your home cooler for you. And so it, it's a really nice feature of this, um, this kind of landscape. Um, then I mentioned I, that I was going to talk a little bit about water capture. So I want you to just think about this for a minute. You have this dense, imagine it's just oh, something the size of this stage. So and you've got this area, it's not very big, and you're a drop of water, and you're coming from the sky, and you've got this canopy overhead of trees, and you hit a leaf. So when this drop of water hits a leaf, the leaf has a waxy coating, and it bends, and the water drops down, and it hits the next leaf in the understory. And it bends that leaf and it drops down and so on down to the grass on the ground where it runs down and hits the ground. And so the, the, essentially the layers open to let water down. But when the leaf is done bending, it pops back up. And now you're the, the drop on the ground and you're trying to evaporate and you go up and you hit the leaf and you condense on the surface of it and you're available to drop that down. And maybe you make it up to here and you condense on the leaves under here and you drop back down. It's a lot easier to get for water to get into that environment than it is for it to evaporate out. And that's why it's better for water capture. Now, if you have wind blowing, then your blow, then, then that, that picture isn't so static, right? You get some escaping of the water, but essentially what you're doing is reducing evaporation when you have this kind of layered landscape. The other thought about this is that it's less work over time. Um, I have a certain amount of energy now, but it's my expectation that 10 years from now, I might have less energy. And 10 years after that, I might have even less. It takes some effort to get this going, but it does eventually become self-sustaining because it's one of these naturally occurring landscapes. There's not so much to do over time. So how small can a patch of vegetation be before you start start attracting wildlife. Um, a photo credit here for the animal photos. They're all from Hal Living's. So he he did the squirrel, and this is me at a, in front of one of the little moths at our place. But it needs to be so it needs to be dense so that the creatures can't see through it. And if you have a twelve by twelve foot square, it's enough. That's a small enough square that you can get a hose in there to do some watering. You can put it on a city lot. You can plant more than one tree. Well, we'll talk about this idea of planting for the mature size of the tree. That's not a terrible idea, but there are some other ideas that need to be added to that for this kind of environment. So it can be, it can be about 12 by 12 as long as the creatures can't see through it. And again, think of yourself as a creature. Imagine when you were a small child and you were making a fort. Where do you make it? Under the dining room table, there's something over you. You immediately get the cushions from the living room and put them around. As soon as you're in there, then you feel safe. Well, creatures are the same way. They need something that can't be seen through and that feels protected. So we're going to get to the nitty gritty now about how to design something like this. And I, I've, I've tried to create something here that's like a coloring book or a paint by number. Like you can pick some things from this list, pick some things from another list and, and put something together so that you leave with a practical idea of how to make this work. Because um, I think sometimes we get a lot of ideas and it's really hard to implement them in our, in our yards. So the main thought is that when you first look at landscape design, people almost always start with a flat map. It's not a terrible idea. But in this case, when you're talking about 12 by 12 feet, you don't really need a flat map because you can get the pots and scoot them around. It's just not that complicated. What you want to do is think about not the, the square, but the cube. You want to add that dimension of height. 
So instead of having your 12 by 12 square or 144 square feet, if you have your tallest tree was 50 feet high, you have 7,200 cubic feet to work with. So that's a much bigger impact if you start thinking about the height of what you're doing. And so you want canopy trees, you want mid-level trees, you want small trees and large shrubs, you want things that are knee high, you want things that are ankle high um, in order to fill up all of that space. Um, one way to go about how, how to think about what do I put in that space is to think about what you want to attract. Choose a species. And this too is a takeaway from the wildlife management plans. You choose a target species and you work towards those. And it just helps you focus on what you're doing as opposed to just, I'm going to take one of these and one of these and kind of see how it goes. Um, I will, I will say though, having done some of that ad hoc work, it works as well. So if, but if you need a way to organize your thoughts, pick a, a target species and think about what's it going to eat? What is the, what does my species want to eat? Is this a bird that's going to eat hackberry and, you know, seeds in the fall? Or like, is this a, is this an amphibian that's going to need a little water pool? Who will it eat? Where will it hide? What will it drink? And what, what will it use for its nesting? So you might need to do a little research about your target species. Um, you know, you can target small mammals, you can target, you know, amphibians or little reptiles or different kinds of birds. And that'll give you a way to a filter to use on your plant selection. So that's just another thought for designing. Then I've got some ideas here about what to do for your canopy trees, what to do for your understory. And so the up high layers, the middle layers, and the down low layers. And this is like, this is your little grab bag list. There's a lot of lists of what are, what are big tree, good, good big trees in this area and what are un good understory trees. So this is by no means exhaustive. If you go to the Texas Forest Service website, you'll see exhaustive complete lists. And I'm not wanting to duplicate that. What I want to give you is something that feels really manageable. These are plants that work in our area. Um, that is unmarked in my property. We've seen them grow. We've seen them work. And, um, they're, and they offer something of beauty and of food for pollinators, for birds, for people in some cases. And so I could talk a little bit more about each of these, these specific tree. Maybe I'll pick one or two, but I don't want to go through the whole list. I want to give you the idea and give you this grab bag that you can pull from. So, um, you know, for example, let me just take the mesquite since there's, uh, there's a widow skimmer is this little damsel fly looking thing in the picture. Um, and she's landed on our mesquite trees. Uh, mesquite trees are sometimes considered weedy. How wonderful to grow something weedy. It grows without any effort from you. And these are the dependable bloomers for pollinators in the summer when nothing else is blooming. Our mesquite trees take our pollinators through July and August every year, except this year. There was so little water, they stopped their bloom in early August and started making beans. And so we're, we're short right now, but it's a very good um, tree for pollinators in the summertime when not much else is blooming. And then the legumes are edible, including by you. So there's a lot, there's wildlife food being made in the fall. And so that's, that's something that, that you might, um, that you might want to think about as one of your bigger trees. Um, I could just pick any one of these for your, for the understory. Um, you know, you know, maybe I'll pick Eve's necklace, which is a tree that, um, it's all, it also has like a little bean on it, it has gorgeous white blooms. It, um, when the trees are young, they bloom on bare wood. So in March and February, you get these white blooms before there are leaves. Then as they get more mature, the, the blooming season is longer and it spans from before leaves to after leaves. Um, they smell wonderful. They come up from root sprouts. So if you plant one, you eventually get a little clump of them. Um, and they are, they're going to seed right now. And, and I'll bring some seeds to the next meeting since I've forgotten to this meeting. Um, cause our, ours is now going to seed. Beautiful tree. It gets maybe 15 feet tall, very, very low water requirements. Um, so I, I could pick others, but I'll just leave those for now. Um, so this right here in the middle, these are the, these are the shrubs and vines. This picture is from, it's a white honeysuckle. It's the Texas native honeysuckle. And this picture is taken from a beautiful example of this woodland ecosystem that's across mountain. 
So if you go to the parking lot and you know where the picnic tables are, there's some oaks that are the overstory. There's a lot of fragrant sumac that's the understory. There's a red bud there. I think the red bud died there. And at the edges where it's very sunny, there's a pollinator garden. So it's a really nice example if you want to go look at this kind of ecosystem. And so this white honeysuckle is one of the vines that's in there. Um, uh, it shrubs. I'll uh, Maybe I'll highlight agarita as the shrubs. Um, it's got a bloom in the spring that's really nice for pollinators. It makes a berry that's edible by wildlife and by you. It has spiny leaves, so it's inherently deer resistant. And that means if you plant your, your agarita here and you plant your tree kind of just right next to it or in the middle, your tree starts coming up through the agarita and you have an automatic exposure that keeps your tree from getting nibbled. So if you take, plant something that's really delicious to browsers like uh, red bud, that it's very hard to get that grow, going if you don't have a good exposure. Your agarita can be an ex exposure for, um, for other, other shrubs that are delicious. So these are some ideas of things you can plant in the middle. Um, then we're just talking about the very bottom layer, some forbs and grasses. This too is a picture from, uh, the garden at Cross Mountain. This is cedar sage and it's under a very dense thicket of ash juniper. And it adds some really nice bright color. Once you put this plant in, you have it for good. It disappears in the winter and never mind. It, sh it will return. Once you have it, you have it. And it's a beautiful, beautiful bloomer. Um, and it also does well in sun and shade. And that was another screen I used for a lot of these plants was something that would start out in the sun and that would be okay once the things around it grew up. It would do okay in sun and shade. So I'll leave you with just these plant lists as a, as a takeaway. We'll be posting this, um, this presentation on our website. So you'll be able to go and use it as a reference and, and feel free to, if you would just like me to email it to you, I just send me an email and I'll, and I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, actually, that's not true. It's too big to go through the email pipe. So we'll post it and yeah, you can see it. So there's some things you're going to have to get over. You're just going to have to get over it if you're, if you're going to grow this kind of an environment. And so one of the things is if you love the look of builder landscaping, you're going to hate it. If you really, really want to see all the flowers in a row and a little neat rectangular hedge next to it, it's going to look terrible to you. So don't, don't start. Don't start because it, you're not going to win yard of the month for this unless you have a really cool eco groovy native planty kind of homeowners association. So if, you know, of course you can grow this in the back and you can put your neat little things in the front and, and, and grow this in the back, but, but it, it looks inviting to creatures. But if you're used to builder landscaping, it won't, it might not look inviting to you. It looks really inviting to me. It's the kind of thing that once you get to know it, it feels really friendly, but it takes a little while. Um, the next thing is that it's, we have this idea of keeping our yards clean. And really the idea of clean and gardening just shouldn't go together. Like everything that happens is happening in the dirt. And, and we just, you know, the more we embrace that, the, the better, the happier we are. So your fallen hardwood, when sticks come down, they stay on the ground and it creates mulch. You leave your leaf litter. Just don't call it litter. Call it something else. Call it something else. It's nature's mulch. And then you can leave it there and feel still virtuous. Um, so you're trying to reduce evaporation and add nutrients to the soil. And then the last thing is that when you create habitat, you're going to be successful and creatures will come. And if they look like vermin to you that needs to be shot, don't create the habitat for them. So here's a little possum. This is one of Hal Living's uh, possums. But we had a baby possum show up in our, a little, little wee baby possum. And if that looks like a problem to you, don't go there. Um, you know, create, think about creating a habitat or what kind of habitat you're creating, but you're essentially putting out a roadside in. And you have food and you have bedding and creatures will come. And so I will just let you know, because for, for if we have this little possum up here, possums eat ticks and ticks are terrible for human health. So you might reevaluate the, the, your possums. But if, but if this feels like a terrible thing and you don't want wildlife to be there, um, think about that before you start planting in this way, because they will come. Um, you know, we have coming to our water troughs, like so many footprints now of all kinds of little critters. Um, so those are some things you're going to have to get over if you do this. And 
it's easier than you think to get over it. Um, then one other idea I want to just add here, which is that you, when you create this kind of environment, you want to plant really dense because not everything is going to grow and a, an ecosystem naturally prunes itself. So you, this is the, this is the, the uh, balancing idea to planting for the mature size. Everything doesn't get to its mature size. Like plenty of things keel over. And I think it's not just happening to me. I bet it will happen to you too. So this is uh, one of the these woodland moths. And this is at Cross Mountain. This is the one at Cross Mountain now from a little farther back. And you can see the evergreen sumac and the high o oaks. You can see that at human height, you can see through this. But at animal height, you can't see through. It feels like you can get in there and hide. Um, this could be a whole talk by itself, but I don't want to go too far. But I just want to say, touch on this a little bit, that there are harmful fungi to plants. But as a very broad statement, fungi really help your, your ecosystem here. When, what we think of as a mushroom, it's just the fruit. It's the peach on the peach tree. It's the reproductive structure of the fungi. The fungi actually lives underground, and it's it's a one-cell-thick thread. There's one-cell-thick threads, white threads underground. If you if you bust open, you know, horse poop, you might see that. Or if you you know, when you, when we dig in a really earthy like uh, environment with a lot of compost in it, you often see these white threads. That's fungi, and fungi form thick mats underneath the floor, the forest floor and of healthy ecosystem and plants attach to them certain kinds of fungi and they use those networks for exchange of food and nutrients and water. And why would this be is, I will digress just briefly because it's just such an interesting idea, is that well, plants have been around for more than 400 million years and they, they evolved in the ocean. And if you think about ocean plants that you know, they have no roots. They're just floating in the water. They have to deal with the salt. Okay. But as plants came on land, when they didn't have roots, they formed how they, how they made that adaptation is they did it in partnership with mycorrhizal fungi. And mycorrhizal just means mushroom root. And they did that in, in partnership with, with mycorrhizal fungi and the fungi sourced the water and the nutrients. And that's how the plants made the transition to land. And 80% of plants today retain the ability to partner with mycorrhizal fungi. So just think about that when, when you think about a healthy environment. If you see mushrooms coming up in your wet leaves or you dig and you see the little white threads, like you're doing something right. And um, be very wary of using antifungal products in your ecosystem because they might be doing, there may be some little thing that's doing some harm somewhere, but they're doing a lot of good under there. Um, so that's my little, that's my little plug for fungi. Um, protect from deer. I don't need to say too much about this. If you live in our county, you know, you know that this is an issue. The, I, I mentioned planting inside prickly plants like cacti and agarita. Um, one other thing that we have found and for something that's way out in the field where it's very difficult to get to is, I mean, I hate to tell you this, but you take a stick, you stick it in the dog poop and you make a little X on the trunk and the deer will not scrape and they will not nibble. They think it's disgusting. And it is for you only briefly, but it lasts until the next rain. And so that's just a little tip. And if you, if you want to come and borrow something from, from my dogs, you're welcome. Uh, so other than that. Like, um, yeah. that's a great idea, and I'm going to test it. We have a porcupine, we have a peach tree with porcupine on it, and I never did that, and I'm going to do it. That's a wonderful yeah. idea. Yeah, let's just see. What did she add? No, it's she, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, would this work to deter porcupine damage? Because porcupines come, and if you see on, on a branch, you'll see something the size of maybe a, you know, the size of a piece of sandwich bread, something like that, that a bark that's just chewed off. And then they go on and chew off another piece over here and over there. And so I, I love that as an idea as a porcupine deterrent, dog poop. It could be a thing. Um, so 
a couple of tips when it comes time to planting. By the way, this is a Texas lantana, and this also is out from Cross Mountain. And it's not, this particular flower has not fully opened out. So some parts are open and some are still in bud. I thought that was really cool. Um, but a couple of thoughts about, about planting. So smaller plants recover more readily from transplant shock. Um, if, if you do, there's several, you can go online and look at tree growing experiments where they plant a one foot tall tree and a 10 foot tall tree side by side. And the differential, the size differential just disappears after a couple of years. And that's just because it's such a shock to the system to move something big. So that's, that's really great news because that means you dig smaller holes. Yay. I'm not the hole digger in my family. Mark is the hole digger and he appreciates when we buy smaller plants. And they're also cheaper. It's easier on your wallet. So, um, so when you're, if you're, if you're putting in small plants, you're doing, a, you're doing yourself a favor in lots of ways. And then the next thing is plant in the fall. You know what a terrible environment it is out here right now. If you put a plant in right now, it's going to keel over. They just can't get established. They need to get their roots established before the, the summer. So a great time to plant is in the fall. And our plant sale at September 30th is timed for that. If you order, then when the time comes, when, when your plants get in on September 30th, you're heading into the growing season that will have the long, or the settling in season, the root growing season, if you will, which is all winter long when the plants are not doing much on the top, but they're putting down roots. They're better prepared for when this happens next summer. Um, I, I'm also going to tell you this tip that we've found. We've experimented with a lot of tree planting. So we've, we've got uh, 125 trees. We've planted thousands of trees. Right now we have 125 cages with trees that we water are watering twice a week during the summer with a watering trailer. So it's um, this is born of experience here. And I'm going to encourage you to risk, resist removing competing plants. You think I'm going to clear this area and then there'll be nothing competing for the water. And that's a thing. But there's another idea that every plant is a little water tower. It's, if it's green, it's got water up in it that cools the ground, that shades the ground. And the bottom line is, I mean, that's some, the bottom line is the, the seedlings that we planted that, that had all sorts of dense weeds, vegetation, whatever, all around them did ever so much better than the ones that were cleared, even when we mulched. If we mulched all around that, the mulch was not as effective as the weeds in, in making the trees be successful. So I don't know what to tell you about that, except I'm telling you what worked for us. And so that might work for you. And it is less work. Um, and, one, and one other thought is that we have the urge to rake our areas to make them really smooth before we start planting. And whether this is for your large, you know, acreage properties or for your small 12 by 12 garden plot, let the, let the ground move. If your dog makes a little dog bed and it has this little oval depression there and something's built up, leave it. That's water catchment. Just imagine you've smoothed your whole yard or maybe you've domed it so nothing gets muddy. All your water is running off to your neighbors. Let them dome their yard. And let some depressions happen in your yard, even an armadillo hole. Every little dip in your yard is water catchment that sinks the water down next to your plants. And then plant the plants that want, that want more water next to the depressions or in the depressions. And you'll help, it'll help you retain water and help those plants, help those plants survive. Um, then the big thing, once you do the big push, you've selected your plants. You've done your planting tips. It's all in the ground. You got a water weekly for two years. And, um, this, this one on the, uh, on the left, this is from the Nipsock plant sale last fall. It's a Texas mountain laurel. Bad things happened. It lost some leaves. And here it is, like leaves leaping out in the spring and it's still, it's still looking great. And it'll, it'll be, it'll be good next year. But this one is caged and you've got to water them through the second summer. So we put them in in the fall. They got their roots established in the winter. We're getting them through this summer. We're going to nurse them and baby them through next summer. And then they'll have another winter. Then they have three winters in the roots that you can, you can, you can leave off 
the idea of watering like it's your religion and you can water when they look a little droopy. Um, so you're going to, so figure out how you're going to do this. So ours are scattered across a 90 acre property and you can't put in piping. It's far from houses. And we got a 500 gallon watering trailer and it seemed like, well, this is great. It'll go anywhere. And we learned a lot of things about where it wouldn't go. And also that when you're driving the tr on a route like that, you're creating a road. There's soil compaction from that. And um, there's just a lot of things to consider. How are you going to get the watering done? Not the least of which is I'm driving the tractor and Mark is walking behind it, holding a hose full of water for several hours, several times a week. So it's just think about the watering thing because it's going to, you're, you're going to have to sustain it for a while. We're almost done here. Enjoy the visitors. These are, uh, these are more of how living's little creatures and you don't, they will come. If you build it, they will come. They will come over your fence. They will, they will come under your fence. They will, they will scramble in and you will be able to sit out with your glass of wine on your porch and watch the creatures. They don't know, you don't know their names and they don't know your name. And yet they'll come and visit. I have only one other thing I want to tell you, which I think is one of the most important things. Yeah. You, you can do this. You don't need a PhD in botany. You don't need to know the scientific names of anything at all. You need to have a heart for creating a space for the creatures, a place of belonging for them. And then you're going to select some plants from the list and you're going to go, you're going to get them and you're going to put them in the ground and water them. And it's just going to, and you're going to think nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Send me a picture next spring. It's just, it's the most encouraging thing in the world. Some of them will, some of them won't make it and some of them will and they'll take over and will become a thing on its own with its momentum. It's a very small idea for a very small piece of land to get you started. And I promise you can do this.